Um, I'm afraid I'm the oddball here because uh, methane is the Cinderella gas. It's, uh, everyone talks about CO2. They're both really important. Uh, but methane shouldn't be neglected. Its um, warming, its effective forcing um, is a bit of a, a watt per square meter. That, that's over half of CO2. So it's, it's quite serious. It's not just cows, of course, we work on cows. Um, it's um, about 60% of the methane in the air is, is generated from human activities. And that, of course, is fossil fuels, um, uh, ruminants, agriculture, um, landfills, um, biomass burning, all sorts of things like that. Um, we've been helped by some extremely helpful cows in Jersey. Um, I couldn't show the, the, the movie, but they, are, they, they love um, puffing into you. It's the front end, not the back end. Um, do not read the newspapers. Um, and we also, we had actually had ITV flying a drone over us as we chased a muck spreader. Um, it's quite dangerous. You've got to get the windscreen wipers working. Um, surprisingly, in this manure, uh, to clearly degas, and manure is another big source. Um, and we, <laughs> we measured an awful lot of pong, but nothing else. So there wasn't methane in there. Now, let's see if this advances. Does this slide advance? Yeah. Um, methane's important. Um, this is a slide that was picked up by the um, United Nations Global Methane Assessment um, that uh, underpinned a good chunk of um, COP26 and what's called the Global Methane Pledge. And they took one of our slides from a paper that was partly out of this program, partly out of another note program. And um, I'm afraid it's a bit gray up there. Sorry, I'm part blind, I'm half blind, so I can't really see this properly. But if you look at the thing that screams to the top, that's methane. Um, the, the zero line is compliance with um, the Paris Agreement, roughly, or a scenario that's Paris fitting. And you'll see the other gases there, they're, they're sort of bumping along. You can see CO2 with the global downturn. Um, after the financial crisis. But then look what methane's doing. And that was completely unexpected when the Paris Agreement was signed. What's driving it is a big change, um, which you can track in the carbon isotopes. For 200 years, the carbon isotopes in atmospheric methane were tracking towards heavier, more carbon-13. That turned around in 2007. Since then, it's been getting lighter. In other words, more carbon-12. Uh, which is probably caused by biological sources. And those biological sources include natural wetlands, in other words, warming, feeding, warming, but also uh, ruminant agriculture. Um, methane's got a lifetime a bit over nine years in the atmosphere, and therefore the question is, is it worth removing it? Um, well, um, the, there's several things you've got to do. First of all, there's mitigation, which is just stopping the emissions. Secondly, there's destruction, which is oxidizing it to carbon dioxide, which, depending on your time scale, takes out um, 90, 95, 97% of the warming impact that you're worried about. Um, and then there's total removal, which means removing the CO2 after you've oxidized it as well, or just removing the methane straight out. Um, so the first thing we can do is find out where it comes from and how much there is in ambient air um, where it's interesting. Now, ambient air overall, it's a, it's a bit less than two part per million. But if you're in a cow barn, it's 100 part per million. Um, if you're a, around a gas compressor facility, it may be 1,000 part per million. Go beyond that and it starts going bang, and then that's when people stop it. Um, at the top here, um, these are just a couple of older studies. You can see um, an active landfill in the UK is the top picture there. The bottom one is um, a coal seam gas well um, in Australia, where it's actually the water storage where you dewater it. And that's true of many gas fields as well. Um, so it's very easy to find you. Um, it's not just satellites, uh, which gets all the publicity. You drive around in a vehicle, and you, you can just measure it directly, or you can use a drone. OK. Um, here's an example. Um, Dave Lowry in our group um, driving around Lancashire. and um, if you look at the, the plots there, uh, coming from the bottom, drive along, and the things that are coloured, um, where there's red dot, there's a lot of methane in the air there. Um, do the isotopes, and you discover it's isotopically light. That's almost certainly cows. Um, drive along, another, another um, orangey bit, there's methane in the air there, cows again. Get to the next one, and isotopically it's much heavier. Ah, that's a gas leak. 
Um, one of our students has actually mapped the whole of London for gas leaks. Uh, you just drive along and um, get a wonderful map of all the gas leaks. We were quite amazed to discover that um, we put this on the web and along came the, the gas people. They were filling in the holes all over the place. And we asked them, what are you doing? Oh, we got these great pictures on the web. <laughs> I, I don't know if that counts as an impact, but it was nice to see it. <laughs> Except they dug up one of our uh, group's road because they'd gone down, we'd gone down that road very carefully and for the next three months, they're digging holes all the way down the road, which was satisfying but annoying. Now, methane rem removal is um, potentially, sorry, it's my blindness, um, worthwhile if the concentration, if the mixing ratio in the air is, is, is above about 100 part per million. If it's only two part per million, um, sorry, these graphs are published so you can see them because I'm sure you can't read them here. If it's only two parts per million, that's ambient here. That's widely done in the, in the natural environment by soil methanotrophs. Um, but doing that uh, deliberately is, is very energy demanding, or it's demanding in all sorts of resources. Um, but if you get to 100 parts per million, and so we've been trying to identify settings where that happens, and obviously around cattle barns that's obviously happening, um, also in gas compressor facilities and um, all around the, the sort of local places where gas governors, where you, you have almost inevitable leaks. There's habitual methane, high methane in there. Um, once you get up to 10,000 parts per million, it's, gonna, it's on the edge of going bang. So that's where people spot that pretty fast and stop that. Um, the second thing, the calculation, is the maximum allowable energy. Um, if you do either destroy methane by oxidizing it, or if you um, totally remove it, that takes energy. Um, so what you've got to compare that is with the CO2 emissions of the, the marginally most emitting CO2 emitter in your local electricity system or energy system. Um, I noticed a couple of weeks ago that, that um, driving near Loughborough, there's coal -fired, there was a coal-fired power station running. So right now, that's coal-fired power. Um, and that emits an enormous amount of CO2. So if you're using electricity to remove methane, it's not on. On the other hand, at um, three in the morning on a windy night in, in the winter, um, when there's a lot of electricity around and nobody using it, then it's worth doing. Uh, as a very broad rule of thumb, about 100 part per million seems to be where this, this sort of break even is, depending on your marginal source of electricity. So is that doable. There are lots of places you can do it. We've already been doing it for years in landfills by piping out the gas and turning it into electricity. But what is, what is dramatic, though, in some other network we've been doing is tropical landfills. And much of the recent growth is coming from the tropics and subtropics. There are enormous landfills in these very, very large cities like, like um, Kinshasa or Delhi, um, which are um, very, very poorly controlled. And just a metre of soil or even half a metre of soil puts in basically biological removal. Very simple. Doesn't cost very much. It's not high tech. Um, I'm, as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm Zimbabwean. Harare's got a great big landfill that's forever burning. Just shovel some soil on it. That's not high tech. Can be done. Uh, what's quite interesting is that uh, there's some recent Australian work that termite vents have very impressive methanotrophs in them that take out half the methane emission. Because, of course, termites rework all the soil. My mother was very keen on, on biochar and soil carbon, but of course, we're well aware that the termites work right over the field and rework the whole system. So it's, uh, it's quite complex. They, they recycle it back up. Um, anyway, that, that's the first thing. Um, uh, 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 another very simple one is, is um, ultraviolet photodestruction. Um, <coughs> you can just paint your, your roof with titanium dioxide. Um, and if you live in the Sahara, that, uh, where there's a lot of ultraviolet, um, that will take out a lot of, of, of methane. Um, broadly, it, it needs a huge surface area. So it's not really viable uh, as a broad thing. But in local circumstances, that probably would be quite good. We did some experiments, and it's, it's pretty effective. Um, uh, the, the work that we've been doing, and, and some of the experimental work as well, this is um, there's, um, through our other methane program, um, Moya, 
we had a double volume of Phil Tran's Royal Society recently, and one of the papers in there is, is the one that's specifically looking at the mass of uh, methane removal. And we also had an article in Reviews of Geophysics. But more to the point um, is the, the ongoing work in the Global Methane Pledge. Um, one of the outputs of that is the International Methane Observatory. I'm actually on the science panel. And there is very, very considerable United Nations interest in this sort of thing. In the right circumstances, methane destruction is certainly well worth doing.